just by a show of hands, how many of you in the audience eat fish? Snapper, tuna, salmon, anything? Now, I'd say that's a large majority of the room. By a show of hands, once again, how many of you have eaten this fish before? I wonder why I don't see any hands this time. I know you might be thinking, why would I ever eat a fish that looks like that when I can eat all the other ones that I previously mentioned? Well, I once believed that too, until I learned that by eating lionfish, I was doing my part in protecting the Belize Barrier Reef. A few summers ago, I volunteered with Reef Conservation International on Tom Owens Island in Belize, where I learned about the invasive lionfish species and its devastating impact on local coral reefs. Lionfish are originally native to the Indo-Pacific Ocean, but people brought them to the Atlantic because they thought they looked pretty in their aquarium tanks. However, after releasing them, lionfish became a serious threat to ocean ecosystems in the Caribbean and Atlantic Oceans. So how can this little fish disrupt an entire ocean ecosystem? Well, those spikes that you see on the lionfish are venomous, and not only do they deter humans from eating lionfish, but also the top predators in reef ecosystems. Lionfish consume toxic amounts of fish in their environments, including commercially important species, and lack the pop predators to keep their population in check, effectively destroying an entire ecosystem's food chain. With overfishing already leaving fish populations vulnerable, lionfish add yet another challenge to reef health while also decimating main local food sources for many coastal communities. And that's where we come in, with a practice called invasivorism, meaning that we become the predators for this invasive species to control their population. This practice is already widely accepted in Belize and many other islands, but with mainstream marketing, we can introduce lionfish into our diets. In doing so, we have the ability to restore local fishing industries, provide coastal communities with a new food source, and revert the balance of reef ecosystems. Instead of continuing to overfish species that are already vulnerable into extinction, we can turn to lionfish. Once you remove the venomous spikes, lionfish become a delicious white fish that is comparable to a variety of others that we already eat. And in many cases, it's also a healthier alternative. But if you're still not convinced, it may help to know that when I was volunteering, a group of 16 teenagers were tasked with cleaning and removing the spear spikes from the lionfish. So if a bunch of 15 year olds on their summer vacation wanted to try lionfish, you can too. And together we can turn it into the next craze in the seafood industry. When we do this, we can support ocean ecosystems while also supporting our own food security, economic growth, and health. My experience in Belize showed me that environmentalism can intersect and even align with core human issues. This human conscious view of environmentalism is called intersectional environmentalism, but it's often overlooked by the environmental movement. When we think about environmentalism, we often jump to renewable energy sources and electric cars. And while I agree that these solutions are essential to solving our climate crisis, small local changes can impact our, our environment as well. Invasivism, for example, goes beyond just helping the environment. It also brings attention to food insecurity and how we can use resources that are often overlooked to solve human problems. Extreme weather, temperature fluctuations, and rising temperatures have already contributed to global food insecurity and will continue to do so in the coming decade. Hence, as we think about global solutions in health and food, we must also consider our environment. And when we do this, we see that environmentally beneficial solutions also benefit humans as well. So now let's turn to a more local environment that many of us are familiar with, the Hudson River. When I imagine the Hudson River, I think of contaminated and polluted water, scarce of life. But the Hudson River and New York City waterways were once home to a lively and pristine marine ecosystem. And at the backbone of this ecosystem were oysters. The natural question that I asked when I first learned this was, why were oysters ever crucial to New York City? Well, oysters contribute to their environment in three unexpected yet important ways. First, they provide an infrastructure and foundation on which biodiverse marine life can thrive. 
Second, they act as a natural barrier to storm surges and can significantly reduce coastal erosion and damage in the event of hurricanes. And most importantly, oysters filter water and remove pollutants at unimaginable rates. A single adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water in a day. Now imagine what that filtering power could do with millions or possibly a billion oysters. New York City waterways and landscapes no longer have to be filled with toxic pollutants and chemicals. Instead, we can have clean drinking water coming straight from the harbor and eventually a healthy reef ecosystem on which tourism, fishing, and many other industries can thrive. Not to mention, New York will also have a cheap and bountiful food source to feed their future generations. The Billion Oyster Project alludes to how restoring our natural ecosystems can generate sustainable local food sources, expand economic opportunities and jobs in a region, and improve our environmental health. This intersectional environmentalism is more than just an environmental framework. It's a tool that can be used to reshape our communities and our environments on a larger scale. All action starts locally, and thinking about environmental issues is no different. So what do you do if you're like me and you don't live near the Caribbean or near a city harbor? Well, invasivism and intersectional environmentalism can be applied to wherever you live. I recently learned that in New Jersey, we have two invasive species, one called purple loosestrife and the other called garlic mustard, which are both tasty herbs that can also be used to solve a variety of common illnesses and infections. Hence, intersectional environmentalism and the benefits that we receive from it can be applied to our daily lives regardless of where we live and what we do. Intersectional environmentalism shows us how our environment is heavily intersected with our daily lives and human well-being. However, more often than not, we don't think of this when we think about the environmental movement as a whole. A study conducted by Yale in 2021 showed that while 71% of adult Americans believe that climate change will greatly impact plants and animals, only 47% of those same Americans believe that it will impact them personally. The study shows that in many ways, our approach to environmentalism is what inhibits us from engaging more people in the environmental movement as a whole. There are three mistakes that we make our, in our approach to environmentalism, and the first is that we often think in extremes. We only hear about raging forest fires and irreversible, irreversible rising sea levels instead of how our local communities are being impacted by our environment each day. Although it's important to understand the global toll of climate change, it can be easy to feel overwhelmed when our solutions to these complex issues will determine the fate of our futures. Tackling climate change feels abstract and impossible to take on in addition to all the other challenges that we face day to day. However, it's this mindset that deters us from making environmentally conscious decisions in our lives every single day. I'd be wrong to tell you that your actions could magically restore the Amazon rainforest or prevent the next major hurricane. But what we can do is redirect our attention to our local environments and our individual consumer habits. And this is what brings me to our second mistake in our approach to environmentalism. We often direct the issue of climate change and environmentalism to others, such as the government and energy sector. In fact, The Guardian found that 60% of Americans blame the oil and gas industries as the root cause of climate change. Of course, companies and national governments have a large role to play in promoting environmentalism, but the, extent, the responsibility extends far beyond them. Many of us feel that because our actions are too small and climate change is not in our control, it is therefore not our responsibility. However, with an intersectional approach to environmentalism, we see that this is not the case. Environmentalism consumes our daily lives because we rely on our environment. Our environment contributes to our health, our economic opportunities, and our food security. So we, it's important that we consider how our inter, in, individual actions contribute to our environment as well when we think about environmentalism, both in the short term and the long term. The last issue that we face in regards to promoting environmentalism is the idea of conflicting priorities. For individuals, companies, and even national governments, we tend to overlook our long-term impact on the environment because we're focused on the issues that seem to be in front of us in our day-to-day -day lives. 
For example, the Pew Research Center found that entering 2022, the public's top priorities for the government were strengthening the nation's economy, reducing healthcare costs, and dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. While 71% of adult Americans said that strengthening the economy was a top public priority, only 42% said the same about climate change. These studies are not necessarily surprising. Of course, we're gonna direct our attention to the issues that are most pressing in the short term, such as maybe the economy or the coronavirus pandemic, instead of long-term issues such as climate change and environmentalism. When we think about environmentalism from the first perspective of extremes, we only hear about climate change and environmentalism in terms of the disasters that occur with it, such as hurricanes and other natural disasters that we encounter. However, it's much harder to see the benefit of our investments in our environment. Occasionally, environmental successes will make headlines, such as when it was announced that pandas were no longer on the endangered species list, but more often than not, this is not the case. It can be discouraging to invest in the environment when our short-term interests seemingly contradict with the long-term interests and goals of the environment. However, with an intersectional approach to environmentalism, we see that because humans are intrinsically dependent on their environment for food security, health, the economy, and so much more, it's also important that we look at these intersections in our daily lives. So what are some ways that we can, we can escape this issue? The first way is through the economy. As consumers, we have the ability to influence the demand for products and can adopt an intersectional environmentalist perspective in our purchases. Our current economy operates linearly, meaning that we take natural resources, make them into goods from which we profit and live, and eventually dispose of them as waste. However, in a circular economy, the items that we produce are either consumed or reimagined into new reusable products. So simply, other than rather looking to get rid of everything that we own and replace it with new items, we can look to goods that have been made from recycled materials and use the items that we already own to make new products in the future. One area where this is really overlooked is the idea of food waste. Food waste fills our landfills and releases detrimental amounts of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. According to the World Resources Institute, if the emissions of carbon dioxide from food waste were treated like a country, it would be the world's third largest carbon dioxide producer after the USA and China. The easiest way that we can integrate food waste into our circular economy is just through our individual actions by curbing our individual food waste. However, since a lot of food waste also occurs within the supply chain, we can recycle it. And one of the easiest ways to do this is through composting. Composting allows food waste to be decomposed and its nutrients to be reabsorbed into the environment. However, with a little bit of engineering and chemistry, food scraps can be used for so much more. We can turn it into energy, bioplastics, medicines, and yes, even sneakers. Through recycling practices like these, we have the ability to make small daily steps in our daily lives that can intersect with the larger environmental movement and promote environmentally sustainable economic growth. When we do this, we have the ability to empower ourselves to make local changes in our environment, in our daily lives, both in terms of our local communities and our long-term environmental interests and goals. So if from this talk you decide to eat a snapper, as a lionfish instead of a snapper, or volunteer with the Billion Oyster Project, I've been successful in showing you that intersectional environmentalism is something that all of us can do in our daily lives. As consumers and citizens, we have power over our local environments and can make changes that may seem insignificant to the global climate movement, but can be significant to our own lives. Whether you start composting in your backyard or kickstart a major environmental campaign in your neighborhood, every action that you take to help the environment not only protects the planet, but it also protects our own futures. Thus, intersectional environmentalism shows us when we think about this connection between human life and the environment, we have the tools to make tangible change in the health and livelihood of both. Thank you.